Hello, today in this series of Metropolitan Discipline Inception uh, uh, series, we are going to talk about directionalities of a metropolis and the chess mechanism of a metropolis. Uh, in 2001, uh, uh, Edward Lemon, uh, uh, a Canadian professional, did for the multilaterals, the World Bank, UN Habitat, IDB, and so on, an analysis of the different typologies, uh, structural typologies of the metropolises. And he found that there were four main typologies. The uh, monocentric structure, which is a center that expands in concentric ways. The sprawl structure that goes along main, mainly around the transport systems no? uh, and, and sprawls into the environment. The multipolar structure that uses the different municipalities around those uh, or along those lines to create different poles and centralities, and the polycentric structure. That was in 2001, and 16 years later, we should understand that out of those uh, uh, mechanisms, systems, models, uh, three do not work, and one does work. And really, must, we must go ahead and not just keep, keep on talking about the same things we were talking 16 years ago. The first one, the uh, monocentric structure, does not work because you, you, when you grow, you grow by concentric circles uh, and you're putting uh, onion rings and, and it, it becomes more and more congested and at the end the whole system collapse and, and you invade the environment progressively and the environment is uh, every time uh, further away from, from the uh, housing uh, locations and where people expand their, their lives. No? So that doesn't work. The second one, the, the, the sprawl structure, the issue is that as there is this, people locate, uh, not depending on distance, but the time it takes them to go to the center. And then they locate uh, along the transport structures. But there is a moment, those transport structures so, take so long, that in, in the interstitial areas of the fingers, they start to, to, set, up, uh, to set up there and to build there. So at the end, there is this kind of web foot phenomena of the metropolis, and, and you end up with a system which is similar to the concentric monocentric structure. So that uh, web foot phenomena doesn't uh, make this finger-like uh, metropolis uh, 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 work well, unless you are Copenhagen and you have a very strong administrative control of the use of land. And so, but that's not the case in most of the metropolis around the world. The multipolar structure uh, has an environmental problem. These elongated structures of urban settlements that are linked one to each other uh, avoid the environmental uh, flow between the different areas. The Germans are very um, keen on, on that kind of... Uh, the, the, these urban fingers cut the environment and create a segmentation of the environment. So we must avoid that kind of continuous system of urban that does not allow the environment to flow in between these municipalities and, and so on. So, so really the only system that really is working and works for the future is the polycentric structure, where these municipalities keep their own identity, keep their own unity, and, and you, they are linked by a high-level mass public transport, generally it's the freight, uh, the the train, the rail tracks, because you must deal with huge amounts of uh, people moving around. But you have the flow of the environment, uh, the flow of the waterways, the blue and the green that go among the metropolis. So the population has the environment close by and can enjoy it. And you keep up the rural urban linkages and you keep up a production of food within the metropolis with this kind of flow of the environment within the metropolis. So this is the really one that works. This is, uh, but you really must, these units of the metropolis, there's urban units uh, that are the digits of the metropolis have to be worked together into a system that as you see is both environment and transport with rail, road and so on. The rail providing accessibility to the center mainly and the roads providing homogeneous accessibility to the periphery in such a way that it will be not a dependence of the central uh, structure of the metropolis, but the location of possibility within those polycentric structures. That's the one that works. And it works because metropolises are not like uh, Walter Kristaller used to say in the central place theory, 
that metropolis are in a featureless plane and then they organize themselves by, uh, by a location into a kind of hexagonal grid depending on the importance of the metropolis. No, metropolis are not in a featureless plane. Metropolis are in locations which are highly strategic and dependent on the ecosystems. They are in some way uh, not controlling, but they are uh, uh, taking advantage of. No? And we saw in some previous uh, presentation how the metropolises have different specific locations, uh, the, the sea coast, uh, the, 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 the crossing of a river. For instance, Paris is there because it's the easy crossing of the Seine with some islands in the middle, so the Romans thought that it was a good place to locate Paris. London is where it is because Julius Caesar, when he invaded England, needed to cross the Thames and uh, London is located in the uh, utmost uh, position where the tides will not affect the, uh, the bridge he had to build. The bridge uh, uh, Julius Caesar built uh, was a pont pontoon, so it was barches, so if you have the tides going up and down at the end, the bridge breaks, so you must have the, 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 the the water flow uh, stable, and London was the location of that stable water flow before the tides. New York, New York is New York because in 1832 the Air Canal was built uh, from the big lakes to access the, uh, the Atlantic, and all the goods from central, uh, the central states, from central of, of, of uh, United States went through the Air Canal to New York, and even if now the Air Canal is not any more important, the control of those finances and those markets has made New York the capital of the world. All the capitals have some kind of, of location which makes of them metropolis. If not, they will be simple towns. They will not be metropolises. So you have a main directionality in the metropolis and you have a perpendicular perpendicularity of the metropolis, the coast and the rivers that flow to the coast, or the main river in the center and the affluence and so on and so on. That, that makes the different typologies of the metropolis that we have seen in a previous uh, situation. So metropolises are in a specific location with a main directionality, which is the coast, the river, the valley, the uh, range of mountains, and then the, the perpendicular secondary uh, directionalities, which create that kind of matrix approach to metropolises. No? And we can work on that of uh, structuring the metropolis in accordance with their topography, with their geography, and even their history, because previous generations were very much aware of that kind of topography, and they built the metropolis in accordance with that topography. So we built up our five elements of, of the uh, physical environmental sector, which is uh, the, uh, the environment, the transport, housing, productive activities, and, and social facilities, and we start uh, building first the, uh, the, uh, the, the environmental uh, uh, system, then the transport system. Together they create the reticula, the, the directionalities and the secondary directionalities, uh, looking at about the trains, the tracks that have to work out the access to the center and the, and the homogeneous uh, reticular pattern of the periphery to have homogeneous accessibility to the periphery. And then we built on that the housing and the uh, activities. Uh, the, this way of doing metropolis uh, through this kind of matricial matrix uh, approach really provides a new pattern for the evolution of historical matrix uh, management. We received, uh, in, during the uh, 20th century, we have had uh, four approaches to, to, matri uh, to uh, metropolitan management, metropolitan planning. The first one was uh, in Vienna, it was Otto Wagner, uh, that uh, in 1912 uh, organized Vienna through a big ring roads, beltways, and so on, but that was a century ago, and the result of that has been that kind of monocentric approach of uh, concentric congestive uh, beltways that uh, po potentiate, uh, give more importance to the center, and then they built up that congestion. We had in the 1930s the hexagonal approach of uh, Walter Kristaller, the central place theory that, as I mentioned, works for regions which have not a main metropolis, but a main metropolis is never in a featureless plane. Then we have in the, in the 70s the archipelago 
uh, approach, uh, mainly uh, by Oswald Ungers from Germany and then in, in England, like uh, Graham Shane, now teaching in, uh, in New York, in Colombia, uh, the archipelago sees the metropolis as a set of islands unrelated to each other, and you go from the one to the other. But we must understand that an archipelago is not archipelago, chaotic archipelago. There is a, a geography under the sea that puts the islands where they are. And so what the metro matrix, the matrix approach to metropolis to comes to see is what is that kind of underlying geography in the metropolis and how to build up the system of that metropolis. We have these four uh, uh, typologies in, in the 20th century, the uh, circular Vienna orbital, the central place theory, the archipelago and the matrix. The matrix and the archipelago are compatible and they can work together into a single system. But I am afraid that now we are uh, mostly doing nothing in most of these emerging metropolises. So we are more into the MOS do nothing approach and that is the mess we are leaving as a heritage for the next generation and that's what we have to avoid. Michael Thompson already analyzed how we go from that kind of uh, hexagonal system into a reticular one and he was proposing how you move the belts into the uh, distributors and how to build the, the distributors into a reticular system. And that's what we are mainly doing in the metropolis. We are breaking the concentric structure of the metropolis where you have the ones who, who have and can be in the center because they, have to, they can pay the high rents of land and there's uh, the have-nots which are in the periphery and you have this kind of antagonism between efficiency and, and social equity. We are breaking that kind of orbital antagonism, social economic orbital antagonism, by breaking it into a reticular system where this, the location can be much more flexible in between the interstitials of these different centralities. An orbital system does not work because it is congestive. Everyone has to go to the center, everyone goes to the center and congests the center, and it is a speculative and the market of land is controlled by the supply, which is what a market should not be. It should not be controlled by the supply. A monopoly is the controlling by the supply. It should be a market controlled by the demand. No? And if you are owner of the square meter or the square feet in the center, you can put the price you want because you control the main asset of the whole metropolis. You are introducing your benefit, the whole infrastructures of the metropolis. The way to break that uh, centrality is to make a, a reticular matrix approach with every location is acceptable because they are all have a similar accessibility. So the market is controlled by the demand instead of the supply. And you don't have a centrality that is congestive. You have a, a, a stable equilibrium mechanism. Wherever you want to go from one point to the other, you have many alternatives. You are not dependent on a radial road. And then whenever one of the segments is congested, you can take the parallel segment to go from one place to the other. So the reticular system in the metropolis, it did work in the 19th century for cities. It has to work for the metropolis in a different scale with a different approach. We are moving from playing dots in the metropolis to playing chess. And instead of just all of us wanted to be in the center, we must realize the different locations of the metropolis and the capacity of each of those locations to have a specific role in a strategy of the whole metropolis. So every one of the pieces of the chess, the center, the queen, the king, the queen, the rooks, the uh, knights, uh, and so on, the bishops and the pawns, can be played by a different uh, by a different municipality within the metropolis and can uh, play a different role with a strategy for the whole metropolis. And we will see that in further presentations later on. No? We are moving from the circle to the grid that we have done so many, many times in the history of mankind. We started with a prehistoric village with huts and a circular palisade for defending because that's the cheapest way of having the minimum infrastructure for the maximum space within the circular space. But when we started to, to grow in that, we, the interstitial spaces were highly valuable and we created for the urban planning the reticula. And that reticula has been going on since Hippodamus de Mileto in Greek times to the Roman camp, to other cultures like the Chinese or the Arab culture as well in certain aspects of it 
to the, uh, the, the uh, development of America, North America, Latin America. You have here the examples of uh, Hippodamus, uh, Roman camp, Beijing, and Buenos Aires. There is only one moment when the reticula was not accepted. It was a playful moment in, in Italy in the Renaissance where it was the ideal city uh, the, the, uh, by Filareto and, and other people. And these cities were implemented. They are beautiful. If you visit a touristic, uh, make a tourist visit, they are beautiful, but they don't work. And they don't work, and we have the same kind of typology in architecture. We have the panopticon typology that we use mainly for hospitals, jails, cemeteries, and parks. And why that panopticon architecture only works for those typologies of jails, parks, uh, hospitals, and cemeteries? Because the client cannot protest. The client is under the control of the single authority that decides to have that kind of circular orbital mechanisms. The reticular mechanisms is much more democratic because you can locate yourself in a position where you decide on your own and you are not related to the dependence of the core. And that is why since uh, in the 20th century, in the 19th century, the 20th century, we are still uh, building up with that reticular approach. Uh, uh, New York in 1811 was the Manhattan grid. Uh, Barcelona in 1864. Uh, Milton Keynes after the Second World War in England, or the Madrid Metropolitan Plan in 1996. Uh, no? And that's not new. New York in the uh, regional plan of uh, 1929 already introduced a double reticula, one in New Jersey, the other one in Connecticut and Long Island, and it, it is part of the normal mechanisms of growth of large metropolis. And that's what we did in Madrid in 1996. And that's why we are going to explain how it works in many other metropolis around the world. Thank you for listening. Uh, next time we will talk about the mental maps, the understanding of the metropolis and the metro matrix. And you can download these uh, slides from the links which are in the slide. Thank you. <laughs>